Let us pray. <clears throat> Pour out your Holy Spirit in this place, O God, so that the words I utter might be filtered and amplified in the ears of all who hear in such a way that the hearts of your beloved might know the word that you have intended for them to hear. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Last week, we began looking at the story of Ruth. Ruth who? Ruth, the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Naomi, whose name means pleasant. Naomi, the wife of Limelech, whose name means God, or rather my God, is king. <clears throat> Many years ago, Naomi and Elimelech were refugees of a drought that had settled in the land near the House of Bread, or Bethlehem. They moved to Moab, next door, uh, to find food for them and, the, and, and for their two sons. Their two sons were named Sickness and Destruction, if you remember. Uh, not the greatest of names. But hey, who am I to judge? Uh, it was foreshadowing, however. They found food, but Elimelech died, leaving Naomi with her two sons, a widow and two orphan children in a foreign land. Now her sons grew up and became providers for Naomi, meaning she wasn't destitute for long, However, after they got married, they too died, leaving Naomi again, a widow, without children, without sons, in a foreign land, and now with two daughters-in-law for whom she was responsible. This was the definition of being in despair, of being destitute. No family nearby, no friend in a, friends in a foreign land. Her husband has passed, her sons have passed. It was time for Naomi to go home. And so she decided to go back to Bethlehem. Her two daughters-in-law came with her. They refused to turn back the first time she sold them to, but that was because it would have been rude if you did it on the first time. So the second time, she said, no, 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 go, go home to your family. Uh, my family has brought nothing but destruction, so go home. One of the daughters-in-law named Orpa, which literally means back of the head or the neck, uh, turned and the back of her head, the back of her neck was facing as she left. However, the second daughter, Ruth, whose name means friend, stuck with her. The third time Naomi tried to send Ruth home, Ruth was practically offended. Naomi knew that Ruth was with her for the long haul. So they returned to Bethlehem. Naomi was welcomed, but to stave off all the questions of all the people that remembered Naomi and Elimelech, remembered that Naomi had two sons she said, don't call me Naomi, for I am not pleasant. Call me Mara, bitter, because God has dealt with me bitterly. Ruth, who was with her, also got a new name. Ruth, that friend that we had just heard about, this wonderful person who had accompanied Naomi through such a journey, through such a life so far. Ruth was given the name Ruth the Moabites, the woman of Moab. That was not a name that treated her well because Moabites were not good neighbors. The Moabites, they were a people of destruction. They lurked on their borders. They were the people that would come, they, they, their daughters would come over the border, marry Israelite sons and corrupt the, their sons. They corrupted the people of Israel. So Ruth the Moabites would not have been dealt with well. 
especially since she was the one who accompanied this once pleasant woman who is now so bitter. You could hear people say her name almost as she walked by. That's Ruth the Moabitess. Hmm. That was chapter one. Now, uh, unlike the other stories we've covered in the last few months, Job and Esther, uh, this is a very quick read. So if you want to read through it on your own, I encourage you to. It's four chapters. We're going to cover half the book in the next few moments, uh, which it sounds like a lot, and I promise it's not. But I'm going to do what I did last week, which is I'm going to read the passage. Um, I said selections from chapters three and four. We're going to be reading chapter three, verses one through 18, and chapter four, verse 16 through 19, I believe it is. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you which verse we're on as we read, but I am going to interject my reflections as we go. We pick up in chapter 3 after Naomi and Ruth have settled back down in Bethlehem. Naomi is, is too old to go looking for food, and so Ruth goes out to one of the local fields to pick up the leftover grain during harvest. It was tradition, and, and it's actually recorded in, I believe it's Leviticus, uh, while they're doing harvest, they're not to go, the harvesters are not to go back to pick up the grain that they missed or left behind. That is to be left for those that are in need. So Ruth was going through the field and picking up whatever leftovers she could find to bring home for her and for Naomi to eat. Naomi was... We could say smart, we could say conniving, we could say manipulative, we could say a lot of things, but she took advantage of the situation and she said, you know which field you should go to. You should go to that one over there. Because Naomi knew that that field belonged to a local wealthy, very wealthy man, a man who happened to be a distant relative. Something important to keep in mind Every family in Israel was given a portion of land. That was theirs, it was theirs forever. Uh, if they ever sold it to someone, it was never sold permanently. It was sold until the next year of Jubilee, which is every 50 years. At 50 years, that would go back to the, initial, the original families again. So you never bought land, you kind of long-term rented land, if anything. And so Elimelech's family had land, but Elimelech, was no longer around, and his sons were no longer around, so there was no one to inherit that land. This was the only way you could purchase land permanently, was to inherit it from a family line that had become extinct. So, the next closest relative was set to pick up that land, was set to purchase that land. Boaz. Naomi believed, was the next person in line for that land. So Ruth went to that field. She started picking grain, and Boaz noticed this new person. He treated her well. He told the workers, leave extra behind and don't bother her. Let her grab what she needs. Even give it to her from the sheaves that you're collecting if you need to. Make sure she goes home with a full, uh, with an armload of, of grain at the end of the day. Take care of her. Naomi saw the massive amount of grain she came home with that night and knew she had struck gold. Naomi and Ruth needed someone to take care of them because they still, they may have been back in Bethlehem, but they were still widows. And Ruth was a widow in a foreign land. Chapter 3, verse 1. Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is going to be winnowing barley tonight on the threshing floor. Okay, first pause. Winnowing barley. This was the process of taking the grain and uh, getting the husk off of it, getting the straw taken away so that all that was left was the grain. This was the last step in the harvesting process and what would be left is all of that true grain. Um, this was 
that last step. And at the end of it, farmers would usually have a feast or a celebration. They'd set apart a, a, a portion for the temple for sacrifice. And then they would celebrate. They would have a bit of a party. Naomi had grown up in Bethlehem, the house of bread. She knew how this process worked. She knew what was going to be happening. And so she said to Ruth in verse 3, Now wash and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go, uncover his feet, and lie down. And he will tell you what to do. Ruth said to her, all this that you tell me, I will do. Okay, important note of context here. This was Naomi's master plan. Let him get a little tipsy, let him pass out and fall asleep, and then uncover his feet. But here's the secret. This is one of those secrets of the Old Testament. Now remember, we you don't say exactly what happened. The Bible, is the, it's the Bible after all. Let's have some decency when we tell the story. And so this is a euphemism. To cover or uncover one's feet is a euphemism for uh, things that happen. <laughs> I, I may be reading from the Bible, but I'm also now in the pulpit. So as you can imagine, this is, this is one of those euphemisms that, that the Bible uses. So anytime it, it involves the feet, it's usually it could be questioned, is it actually the feet or is it something else? Um, and, and to top it all off, this was happening on the threshing floor. And in Hosea, uh, Hosea sh suggests that the threshing floor, this place where harvest is finished, is a, is a place of questionable activity. Things happen on the threshing floor. So. Ruth was to go to this place where he was a little bit tipsy, he had fallen asleep, she was all dressed up, she had taken, ba she had taken uh, the, the, what am I thinking of? She had, she had cleansed herself, there was the word I was looking for. She had cleansed herself, she was ready. So she laid down beside him, uncovered his feet. What would happen next? This was actually very, it was, it was a scary moment too, right? She was taking a huge risk. It was risque and risky. The scene is fraught with sexual overtones. It's sought with tense moments and, and secretive actions. And so we get to verse six. So Ruth went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and he was in a contented mood, he went, to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came stealthily. She came stealthily and laid at the end, or, and, and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and there, at his feet, was a woman. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. Another pause. The plan is going exactly as expected. Ruth has just said two important things, however, to, that I want to clarify. Boaz awoke to see Ruth was there, and he was partly naked. He doesn't remember what happened before, but one plus one is not actually equaling what he thinks is two. Who is she? It's that Ruth lady that he saw in the field that he told the workers to be nice to. She responds, spread your cloak over me. You are my next of kin. And he is a relative of Elimelech. He is the one who is also wealthy enough to be able to buy this land, to purchase what would then include Ruth and Naomi. Ruth was saying, surprise, you're the one. The land could be yours. I could come with it. Spread your cloak over me. Protect, protect me, literally, physically, but figuratively, and more. 
Boaz has just been startled out of a drunken slumber to this bombshell. There are better ways that this could have been done. However, this is what they decided. So how did he respond? Verse 10, he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone out after a young man, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid, for I will do for you all that you have asked. And for the assembly of my people, they will know that you are a worthy woman. But now, though, this is, though it is true that I am a near kinsman, there is another kinsman who is more closely related than I. Remain this night, and in the morning, if he will act as next of kin for you, good, let him do it. If he is not willing to act as next of kin for you, then as the Lord lives, I will act as next of kin for you. Now, lie down until morning. And so, she lay at his feet until morning. But she got up before any person could recognize one another. For he said, it must not be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. Then he said, bring your cloak that you are wearing and hold it out. And so she held it out and he measured out six measures of barley, which is about 70 pounds of barley. Put it on her back and he went into the city. Ruth came to her mother-in-law who said, how did things go with you, my daughter? Then she told her all the things that the man had done for her, saying, he gave me then these six measures of barley. For he said, do not go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For this man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. So how'd it go? It's my imposition of tone on this, but, and there are several ways to read the tone on this. She was eager to hear. She had just played Yenta. She had just played matchmaker. However, more practically, how did things go? Are we gonna be okay? Are we going to be destitute for the rest of our lives? Or did we just get hitched up with one of the wealthiest man, men in the area? Tell me. That's a lot of grain for him to give her as well. This was a sign that he was invested. He was excited, he was earnest, and, and as Naomi mentioned, he wasn't going to sleep until this was figured out. Boaz was thrilled that a beautiful young woman would take interest in him. Forget that Naomi orchestrated all of this and then done so as a desperate act of survival. Take that for what it's worth. She had effectively bartered her daughter-in-law as a last-ditch effort. We keep that in mind as well. Do we know how Ruth felt about it? Besides being an active part in a uh, active participant in this wager, in this deal, in a foreign land, attempting to not have to do back-breaking work for the rest of her days, well, we don't know how she felt about it. We have no idea, but that's the way things went in those days. And, and we'll touch on this in a minute again. We're gonna jump to chapter four, verse 13. Through local, several local customary transactions, Boaz did indeed find the man who was next of kin, and, and he stood with this man at the gate of the city, which is where legal transactions were, uh, were made, in front of other elders of the city, of the town. And Boaz said to the man, would you like to have this land? And the man said, oh, yeah, well, sure, why not? And then Boaz said, well, that's great, but a Moabitess comes with it, just so you know. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm good. And so Boaz says, okay, I'm in. <laughs> and that's effectively those verses that I've skipped. So, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive and she bore a son. And by tra tradition, this son, though a son of Boaz, 
was a son of the first wife of Elimelech's son, therefore, inherits this land that Boaz had purchased, therefore re restoring, resurrecting, if you will, his family lineage. So this son was not just some kid that was another one of Boaz's sons. Boaz has given life to this now, this once extinct family line. That's exciting and that's important. Verse 14, then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a next of kin. May his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has borne him. This, though it could sound like a secondhand dig at Naomi or a dig even at her deceased sons, uh, is in fact a statement of deepest reverence to God. It is of highest praise that a Moabitess, whom she had brought home with her, had become the mother of this lineage again. Moab may have taken Naomi's husband and sons, but it gave Naomi, the most valuable daughter-in-law, a female, a female of value, which we believe to be normal, but in this society was huge. A female who, in, who was inherently not seen as a person of value at all in society, especially an immigrant, a scornful immigrant, one of those Moabite people, this woman, became a restorer of life, a restorer of hope, granting Naomi preservation of her lineage, granting Naomi life and security for the rest of her days. And let's be honest, a grandson. And anyone who is a grandparent knows that your life has changed when you first hold that grandchild. So much joy, much hope washed over all who knew the story. Verse 16, then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse or his nanny. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, which means servant of God. Obed became the father of Jesse, meaning God's gift. And Jesse, if you recall, is the father of David, meaning beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me just say first that this is one of those Old Testament stories that I love because it has so much meaning within it and so much subtext. It has so many assumptions, however, that are hiding and so that's why I, did, I read the scripture the way I did, hoping that this would become more important or more evident. Um, but with that said, this scripture does, and more emphatically and clearly, tell us something that I think we need to remember as we live our lives. This is part of the scripture of canon, so it tells us something about God, tells us about who God is, who we are in relation to God, and three phrases that echo back to last week, but three phrases come back, and I hope they continue to ring in your ears. First, we are loved. After all that has happened, Naomi returned to Bethlehem as a widow. She was childless. Two things that she was not when she first left. And yet, in Bethlehem, she found care and love amongst those who remembered her. And despite being a daughter-in-law, Ruth found in Naomi the love of a mother. And in a foreign land where Ruth hardly felt the love, she found love with Boaz. Eventually, when baby Obed was born and able to show affection, he would have shown love to Naomi and to Ruth. All of this is a testimony to remind us that the source of love, God as the source of love, 
God loves each of God's children. It's a reminder that for God's faithful, that uh, the love of God is for all. Naomi was loved even when she felt not loved. Ruth was loved even when she felt unloved. You are loved even when you don't feel loved. Second, we are enough. Naomi was a widow who had buried her sons. By all accounts, she was a burden on society. She was not worth a whole lot in that day and age. This story, this tale, told to the generations of ancient Hebrews and that was eventually written down and then later taken to be a book of the Bible, it was shared among a people who who gave no value to anyone who was not an Israelite person. Someone like Ruth had no value in that society, especially since she stole a son of Israel. But God had a plan for her. God redeemed her, not, not only so that she had a purpose as a wife to Boaz, a, a man of value in society, she became, in and of herself, incredibly valuable to the people of Israel. She restored a line, a family line, within the people of Israel. She, re, she was part of, key to, the resurrection of Elimelech's line. And that lineage resurrected not only Elimelech's heritage, but would become the most honored lineage of ancient Israel. King David, forever, people would say, Obed, father of Jesse, father of David. Forever, that child's name would be mentioned, and forever, his mother is Ruth, the Moabitess, a name that brought such scorn, but a name that is now worth so much. It's a story that proclaims God's absolutely outrageous love for anyone and everyone of God's children, regardless of heritage or background, regardless of upbringing or experience. God loves us, and God has made us enough for the call that we have been given in life. And finally, we are not alone. For Naomi, who had been brought to a foreign land by her husband, who had eventually died. Naomi was still not alone as she had her sons. And when her sons passed, she still had her, da her daughters-in-law. And she still had people at home that she could go to in Bethlehem. Even when Ruth felt alone, she had Naomi. Even when she was on the outskirts of society, she was then embraced by Boaz. We are not alone. You are not alone. The story of Ruth is one of great difficulty and harsh realities for people, especially for people in their day, and, and we need to remember that, and, and that's why we spend so much time on the details of it. But it's a reminder that even when life is so terrible, when life is not going the way that we want it to go or we expect it to go, we can be reminded that in the face of awkward truths, in the way, face of sadness and grief, contrary to the hopelessness that we might feel, this is one of the many testimonies that through thick and thin, through rain and shine, through, fam through famine and through plenty, through fear and confidence, God's love is present. God has created every person for a reason. And God is beside us even when we begin to doubt that is true. So Ruth's story is a reminder that you are loved. You are enough and you are not alone. You are loved, you are enough, and you are not alone. Take a moment to find someone near you and you're going to say those words to them, okay? Turn to someone and say, you are loved, you are enough, 
and you are not alone. I know, I just broke all the social conventions of Presbyterianism. We're gonna say it one more time, but you're gonna say it about yourself. So I am. I am loved. I am enough. I am not alone. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.